Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How is everyone this week? Everybody's doing good. Nothing too crazy. Morning. No, not really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, at least right. Um, great. So this week we're going to be working on some pharmacology anesthesia stuff. Um, last week we kind of talked a little bit on diagnostic imaging. It was our week to do pharmacology, but then we kind of like jumped into diagnostic imaging, which was fine. So, um, so yeah, any questions at first um, that you guys have? I have a couple, Beth, um, to maybe put on the radar. Um, some of the anesthesia I struggled with on some of like, um, just with like the, <clears throat> I've never really learned like the MAC. So that was like some of my questions and like, um, I'm sure this will come up, but when we were like calculating, um, like the whole title volume. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. We can definitely go over that. Um, and, um, going over Mac is really good. I, even though we sort of went over Mac when I was in school, um, we didn't spend a lot of time on it. Um, when I was in school and, um, for some reason, I, I mean, granted we had like so much to go over, um, spring my dogs are playing even though it sounds like they're probably killing each other um and then but it actually is really important to have a grasp over especially if you are working on a lot of anesthesia or even just a little just to have an idea of it because mac actually describes the dosage of an anesthesia agent that we're giving even though many times we look at you know, like isoflurane, you may be looking at your vaporizer and you are um, saying, okay, well, for isoflurane, our, you know, we might be maintaining our patient at, you know, 2% or, or whatever, but that might not be that way in every situation based on some of the, you know, pre-medications that you're giving or um, induction medications you're giving or anything like that too. So it really depends on the protocols you give. So you do have to base it on MAC, which we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and what if, because you guys are brand new um, to this field or newer to this field, what if we have a new um, anesthetic agent that comes out um, and we don't really know what that maintenance is. Like we've had, you know, sevoflurane out for a really long time. We've had isoflurane out for a really long time. So we've been able to play with these drugs for a long time to be able to know where we're comfortable at. Um, but if we have a new drug that comes out, we are going to have to like kind of play with these drugs to find out where our comfort zone is. No, Um, so that way we can, um, so I'll be, have to play around with that drug in order to find that comfort area. 
um, until until we can actually use it. So we use Mac to be able to kind of dose those things out. Um, so those are two really good things. And then we'll talk about title volume and why that, why that is important to know. Um, again, you know, we use title volume for a couple different reasons. One, we use it to figure out our bag size. And so a lot of times we do title volume and then um, move into title volume and then multiply by six to get our bag size. But then we also figure out title volume if we're like working to figure out like our uh, ventilator situation. So if we're putting an animal on a ventilator, we're going to need to know how much um, lung space that they take within every breath or, you know, that type of thing so that we can actually set our vaporizers or sorry, our ventilator settings appropriately. Um, so yeah, that's one big reason. Um, and so you may think like, well, you know, I plan to work in general practice so we probably won't ever have a ventilator. You just never know, number one. And number two, um, we're getting into spaces now that general practices may actually get ventilators at some point or just at least a small one. Um, and more and more Frequently, we are having general practices do at least some orthopedic procedures too. Um, and so it's not unheard of that they might get a ventilator too. Um, so it's nice for you guys to know those things as well. So, so we'll go over those two things. Any other things that really were peeking out to you guys? at least right off the bat. No. Can I at least start there and then I'm sure we'll get more questions as we as we go. So alrighty. So what I'll do is I will share my screen. We'll get to something we can work off of. Um, and we'll talk about, first we'll do our um, title volume because that will be the first like, easy thing to talk about. Um, so when we do, when we deal with title volume, um, our title volume, again, means how much space um, our, our patient's lungs can be able to breathe in one breath um, in, in just one, one breath within itself. So um, we'll say title volume. So title volume is essentially 10 to 20 mils per kilogram, okay? So in some textbooks or maybe even just like what you learned in school, um, some you'll see that it might be 10, 10 to 15 mils per kg, but overall, we do try to expand that to at least 10 to 20 mils per kg. And we do need to also take into account too, just like a body score condition on our patients as well. So like we want to do technically like their most ideal weight size. So if you have a very, very obese animal, then kind of take their ideal body weight. Granted, if they're just slightly overweight um we can utilize that that's okay like we don't have to be down to the very specific but you know just taking like if they're like a nine out of nine we do need to try to like lean that down just a little bit so that we can have something a little bit more accurate right so um what you can also do too, is you can go straight down the middle too in, in certain situations. So you can just do 15 mils um, per kg. Um, 
where we get caught up sometimes is some people will say, oh, you know, it's your hospital. Like when we are doing bag size, they have like another formula, which we can talk about. Um, and what they do is in a sense of bag size, they will do our title volume, or I'm sorry, our bag size formula is title volume times six. So for bag size, kind of getting ahead of myself. Bag size is title volume times six, right? And so if you look at this formula, right, it's again, two numbers, but what some people will do in practice is that they take that formula and they say, well, what we do is we take 60 mils times kilograms. And that is how they figure out their bag size. And really what they're doing in this case is that they're taking that first number here, that 10 mils, and they're taking 10 mils times the six times kilograms. So they're getting the first number, but then they're not doing that second number, okay? So in that case, you can absolutely do that, that's fine, but then just always make sure to take that first number that you get here, and then to remember to at least multiply by two to get your second number, okay? So there's, in the back size aspect, you have to have two answers in, in your formula so that you can make an educated decision there. So we'll talk about this one in just a minute um, so that you guys can, can see that. Um, because sometimes we will have a situation where you might have like a 1.5 liter bag that you get and then up to like a three liter bag. And so we need to pick something in between that makes sense for your patient. And so you may if you only get one answer and it was 1.5 liters, you might pick something that might have been too small for your patient. So you may want to go with at least a two liter bag or you go with a two and a half liter bag if you have two, you know, in between sizes and stuff like that. So, um, but let's first start with our title volume first. So in this case, so this, your title volume is just figuring out how much an animal takes a breath within one breath, all right? So um, say we have, for sake of making things simple, a um, 20 kilogram dog, okay? Um, so our 20 kilogram dog, we are going to take and we go, okay, so 20 kilograms. And then I just go 10 mils here. That's my multiply. And then I'm going to also do my 20 mils on the bottom here. All right. So when I multiply by 10 mils, I'm going to get 200 mls for my first answer, because I multiply 20 times 10. And then at the bottom down here, I get 400 mls, right? So it's just asking how much they actually take in one breath or how much they potentially could take in one breath. So if you are trying to set your ventilator, you that's part of your setting of how much that they would actually take in one breath of of how, you know, of that amount. All right, has anyone ever set up a ventilator? We're not yet. Yes, for cataract surgeries. <laughs> okay, perfect. So you're probably fairly used to this. It, that's part of the, the starting process of knowing how to do title volume. Yes. Okay. 
And then from there, you have to know at least you're looking at your manometer then, right? And then going, okay, um, what do we not want to our pressure manometer? Like, um, we don't want to go above what in our pressure manometers? 20. 20, right? So if we know our baseline of our tidal volume, right? So we say, okay, this this patient, we don't want them to breathe, you know, they're roughly around 200 mils to 400 mils in one breath, right? So maybe we set it at, you know, beginning at 200 or 300 mils, okay? And then we can increase it slowly. Um, we'll look at the pressure on the manometer and say it's at like 15 um, centimeters of water, okay? when we're set it at 300 mils each breath, right? So if it's the pressure is at 15 centimeters of water when we are looking at that pressure manometer. That means that they're not taking enough breath or enough air in, in that one breath, right? So we can actually increase that amount of tidal volume that we're giving them because we can give them more. So when we continue to increase it, our, our manometer will go up a little bit. So let's say it goes up to 17, okay? So then we continue to increase it until it gets to roughly about 20. So say we land on, you know, 375 or whatever, and then we're good. Does that make sense a little bit? What are you increasing to get that pressure manometer up when you're yes. saying like you increase? You're going to increase your tidal volume. So, so you're going to start by having your tidal volume calculations that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so when you have those calculations, you know this um, range that you're going to be around, okay? And so when we started with that, um, you know, we kind of go on a, um, we started by saying, okay, we're going to start at like the 300 range, right? By, by seeing where we're at. And so when we looked at our first initial manometer, where it was at, it was at like 15 centimeters of water. And so we're like, okay, well, we, we can still do better, right? And so we increase our tidal volume um, because it's only at 300 and we still have room to go up because our calculation was at 400. And even mm -hmm. if our calculation was 400 and we still like, you know, say we went up to a little over 400, like that's still okay too, you know, if it's a little bit, like it's a calculation, right? So, but, um, but in this case, like we started at 300, right? And so we turn up our tidal volume to, you know, say, three, like you're not going to know the specifics, but for a case of you guys just knowing, like say we did 325, right? Um, So we're doing like very small changes just to see like how our manometer is changing. Okay. And so it goes up to like 17. And so you're like, okay, well, I can still make these minor adjustments and see how it goes. So then you make it up to, you know, 350 and you're seeing that, okay, it went up even more. And then you increase it a little bit more and then it went up, you know, you're, you're at by this time 375, that type of thing. So as you continue to increase and you're about, you know, that 20 centimeters of water, you're still within your range, your, your range that you calculated. Um, and you're also meeting that pressure that you guys know is like your targeted area. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, and this is all a setting on uh, the ventilator, right? So like, correct. Okay, yeah. so yeah. that's where that where you're able to run both and see the differences. Okay, correct. Yes. Yeah. So depending on how the ventilator looks, so many of them, like especially the anesthesia ventilators that you'll see, they're like little tiny knobs on there or whatnot. They're not like digital. Uh, most of them are not digital. Um, if you're working like ICU, there are way more digital ones um, that you'll see. Personally, the anesthesia ones are a lot more simple to just see because there's not a lot of settings um, to handle. So I always tell people to like learn ventilators on your anesthesia ones first. Um, but as long as you understand the concept of like, okay, my tidal volume, changing the breath, and this is how I set that up. And then the next part from that is how many breaths am I going to want to give in a minute, right? So, I mean, you're looking at under anesthesia, okay, well, how am I maintaining my patient under anesthesia versus how am I going to wake them up in, under anesthesia, right? So when we maintain our patient under anesthesia, how how often are they breathing under anesthesia typically. And this might change for depending on your patient to use, so I'll say this, this might change depending on your patient and the type of surgery that they're needing, but overall. So Beth, sorry, I had a question. So mm -hmm. when you're, um, the when we're looking at our anesthesia machine um this is specifically for an actual we have a like if we have a ven ventilator right correct That's, yeah okay, this would be so, like if you have a ventilator now okay, okay. This, I, never, I don't think i've ever seen one yeah does no it, does it show anywhere also like in a monitor like in a when you're in does it actually have something like that that you're it or, won't or, have oh, it okay. on a monitor however um there is let me just try to find you guys a picture yeah, I'm um, how, for images to understand what yeah it looks like um however uh, okay so I will, this is like, okay, so, I'm not promoting this brand, it's just the one I see the most. Um, and it's honestly probably the, I shouldn't say that's probably the easiest one. It's just the one that I learned off of. Um, so what happens is all right so um so here is it says volume so this is the volume button so that's your title volume okay and it is a very very touchy knob right i don't know if Steph, I think it was Steph, you said, you, was it Steph? I don't even remember now. Um, that you used ventilators? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Is this the one you guys have? We used to have that one. Now we have a, one that's similar, but okay. okay. yeah, we have other ones too. <laughs> okay, got it. I'm like, this is like the, the old old man 
been in it's been in the field for a while. Actually. That's the so, one I learned on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really easy to like use. So um so if you look at it, like there's not much to it. Um, so you will have um the your volume down here. So that's your title volume again. And then the rate is right here. Okay. So when you um, have this, you will need have to have this filled up all the way. And this is filled up with obviously um, your anesthesia or, you know, oxygen or whatever. I, to this day, am the type of person that I have it filled up with my test lung, which is just a, a like, re like a reservoir bag. <laughs> so I'm just weird like that. Um, and that's just how I learned. Um, and it's probably because I'm just not a, a surgery anesthesia technician and I am a like trained ER technician. So the amount of like surgery that I do on an everyday basis that is on like how oh gosh that's on a ventilator is just not that much uh, sure if I have to flip a patient over to you know a ventilator and can't, and I'm not able to do that like that um it's fine it's just that I would prefer to do it on a test lung first so what I do is I will we'll have it like on a reservoir bag first that would fit like my patient um, and then set it all up. So I know like I have everything hooked up appropriately um, ahead of time and then switch it over to my patient and then make the minor adjustments that I needed to for my patient. So, um, and that's only because like the amount of time that, again, that we use a ventilator in emergency, um, is just not as often as we do in, you know, surgery and anesthesia. So, um, sure we use it, but not, not to the amount that we always do. So, and same thing, I'm sure ophthalmology, they use it way, way, way than we would in ER. So you probably do all the time. So what you, you actually do <laughs> exactly i'm like you could do this in your sleep but for me you know it's just like out of habit and we could probably do it like you know have a run of animals throughout the week and i would still be like no i'm just gonna still do my thing because i again it's a confidence thing like you know that i just have to like make sure that i do it that way because there's you know like if I screw that up like I would just feel awful so yeah um so even us old people have confidence issues so um so what you do here is you have this filled up right um and then your title volume then goes down from here okay now they do have smaller um like smaller red I guess reservoir things for here so like if you have a smaller patient you don't have to use this big one um but and it just goes up to five a little is it a thousand can't even remember now I it's think it's a thousand okay um but it's much smaller so you can see the increments a little bit better um so what happens then is that this little guy here, um, it will go down and it makes that little noise, like it plunges down and then it clicks at that specific spot that you want it to go down to. So say we were at 400 or close to 400, this would crunch down, right? And then at that 400 mark, that's where it will go back up. So the patient then is taking a breath when this thing is going down, okay? And then when it fills back up is when that patient is expelling that breath back in, okay? And, um, and that's essentially how they're breathing rather than using 
our reservoir bag. This is essentially our reservoir bag. Oh, okay. That's what I was I was wondering. I'm like, okay. is there like a connection between or you or you're using the two at the same time or yeah, no, this is oh, that's your this actually is oh, correct. Okay. Correct, correct. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um so what we do from here then, okay, so we have our volume that we can set, we can control that. And then we can control the rate that we are giving their breath. So this is actually a really great um, concept too, because there are gonna be some certain types of surgeries where we are gonna want to maybe hypoventilate a patient um, versus have them breathe you know, their own normal rate for themselves, um, or we want, you know, or we want to just control their breathing, right? So I don't know if you guys remember um, when we even talked about in, in the ER aspect, or maybe you can recall from school in, in ER, like CPR aspect, when we, I, Bo, Ventilate patients. Okay, what happens when we hypoventilate patients with our perfusion? Is it that all the anesthesia is not flowing? properly like through their whole body like is they're not getting enough breath like deep like in like proper breaths I don't know how to so we can still maintain their anesthesia in many different ways and it's not saying like we're not, we're not going to um give them like a lot of breaths we might like instead of giving them 12 breaths a minute, we might bring it down to eight breaths a minute or sometimes, well, when we're weaning them, we try to bring them down to six breaths a minute or something like that. But we might bring them down to, you know, rather than 20 breaths a minute, we'll bring it down to eight breaths a minute or something. So if we're hypoventilating them, okay, so this happens a lot in, anyone deal with neuro patients? Or have dealt with neuro? Um, but there are certain parts of procedures that they need to hypoventilate a patient. So why might we need to hypoventilate a patient? Why do we hypoventilate our patients during CPR? Anyone ever wonder that? Is it because they're too deep into anesthesia? You want to like bring them out? Mm, that's a good guess. But remember in, remember in CPR, they're not under anesthesia, right? So there's a correlation in those two. Is it something to do with like, coping with or like having a result of like high CO2 production for hypoventilating them? That's a good thought process. So um, you're on the right thought track with that. Is it that we want to be able to let them breathe? on their own and be able to to count i guess to be able to to listen if they're able to do it on their own i mean like their heart no not necessarily so what happens what happens anyone ever hear about um whether or not 
their cerebral perfusion is affected on if we hyperventilate versus hypoventilate? Um, hypoventilate and hyperventilate, I kind of get those two completely confused. It's right. the same thing for everything else that's hypo and hyper. Yeah. So can you explain that to me real quick? I'm sorry, this mm -hmm. is a real dumb question. Yeah, so hypoventilate means that we're giving less breaths or that they are taking less breaths, right? Hyperventilating means like we're taking more breaths. We're, we're taking a lot of breaths or we're giving a lot of breaths. So in the case of like CPR, right? So CPR, ah, CPR. We are only giving about eight to 10 breaths per minute. Where old school um, CPR protocols is that we would hyperventilate patients. And this was in human medicine and stuff like that. And we ended up switching it, completely flipping it because we are finding that patients were actually dying um, due to our protocols. So if you guys actually watch, um, and I bring this up all the time, if you guys actually watch some of the ER episodes from the 90s and then 2000s, <laughs> I'm, I'm binge watching them now again. Um, they actually talk and, and say like, oh, hyperventilate this patient. So um, it, it was a thing like, to, to hyperventilate patients um, if they were crashing, if they, you know, needed CPR or whatever. And even if they got them back, they were brain dead. Is it because they're like, their body is metabolizing, like relying on the gases that they're I don't know. Sorry. I was just thinking out loud because I'm trying to. Yeah, like, no, think, you're good. You're good. You know, because I know. So like, you know, where am I? So, I'm trying to get my brain. I'm you're sorry, thinking of I'm, the CO2, right? You're thinking of the CO2 yeah. relying on. Yeah, CO2. So this is where, where I thought of as well. Like, yeah, we want them to take their own breaths, right? To build up that CO2. That completely makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But... And that's like one of our keys too, is to eventually, and our key to like on the ventilator too, is once we are starting to wean them off, we do start turning them down um, so that the CO2 builds up and they it triggers their mind to then go, oh my gosh, I need to take my own breath, right? But mm -hmm. in this case, there is something else that we need to think about. And that is that if we hyperventilate, so hyperventilate, this actually um, vasoconstricts, so makes all of those vessels in their brain shrink up. So vasoconstrict. So they're not getting the perfusion their body needs. Yeah. So vasoconstricts all of those vessels. And so all of that oxygen that we are providing them, right, to their, I go like this because I'm thinking of CPR. <laughs> um, it's it's maybe going right to like their other tissues, but it can't get to the brain like it's supposed to, right? So if it's vasoconstricting when we hyperventilate, what is it doing when we hypoventilate? I'd assume just the opposite. Yeah. So it's gonna increase the ability to have that perfusion because of the vasodilate versus the vasoconstriction. Good. So it's like you're thinking opposites for the hypo and hyper with like, the, okay. Yeah, so vasodilates. So it's gonna open up those vessels 
And then we're able to get that blood flow up there faster, right? So in the case of like CPR, especially, we're all freaking out. And so in that situation, it's like, oh my gosh, we need to take, give them so many breaths because things are really, really bad, but we need to sit back and then go, oh, okay, just like chill out for a second because we need to actually give them the appropriate breaths, right? Because the more we give them breaths, we're actually going to do them harm because that we need, you know, in this situation, yeah, we need to help the heart, right? But in all actuality, like we cannot like fix the brain if, you know, we, we can always, in a sense, repair a heart, uh, give a new heart, you know, it's hard to, to give a new heart in the animal medicine, but you can always give a new heart. You can always give everything else, but you cannot right now in this day and age, like give a new brain, right? We haven't really conquered that yet. So um, we have to be able to, that is our main key component to be able to um, preserve that first and then preserve everything else. So we have to, to give that oxygen supply um, and preserve that. So, so yeah, hypoventilating. So in the case of like neuro stuff too, um, in surgery and all of that, there are going to be times where they say, hey, we're going to need to hypoventilate during this aspect of surgery or whatever, because maybe they're doing a craniotomy and they need that patient to have a lot of oxygen um, to the brain um, or anything like that. Um, those are some crazy, scary surgeries. Um, luckily, I haven't been in the surgeries, just uh, monitored them postoperatively. So um, but they might hypoventilate that patient. So there's getting a lot of oxygen to the brain, um, or maybe they're doing like a CSF tap. So again, they're hypoventilating because they want there to be a lot of oxygen supply to that area. Okay. So, um, so that's, that's really important for you guys to know the reasoning behind those things of why we hypoventilate versus hyperventilate those patients. Okay. So with this machine, uh, Beth, if you're trying to do, you know how sometimes you do a, a an extra breath or, you know, you're, yeah. you're with this machine, do you do this or you just actually let it do its thing without even having to? So this, you actually wouldn't have to do an extra breath or anything because it's actually giving breaths uh, all the time for you. And uh -huh. you are actually, um, because of the fact that it's going to that 20 centimeters of water all of the time, you should be okay. Um, obviously, you can always change your rate. So here at the bottom, you can change your rate. So if your doctor's like, hey, um, you know, maybe we need to change our depth or something like that, you can always change your rate of anesthesia by, yes, turning up your patient. Um, you can also change your depth by changing the rate that your patient is breathing. So it's hard to see, but it's, I think it says like, 10, 12, 20, 30, or whatever on there. So you can always change like your breaths that you're giving per minute, um, stuff to that nature. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, so one other question that sometimes that I've seen is, and it's a really weird question is, um, what is the tidal volume for a patient per minute? And that's like just a rough, you know, rough thing. So they'll say like, what's the tidal volume for this 20 kilogram patient if they're taking 12 breaths a minute? Okay. So the problem with that is that a lot of students freak out because they, they 
see numbers and a problem and then they're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how to do this problem. I've never seen this before, right? But really what it's, you guys know this because you already know this formula, right? And you know how to do the problem. It's really easy. And then you know, they said the respiration rate is 12 breaths. No, I can't. Breaths per minute, okay? So all you have to do is take that 200 mils and the 400 mils and multiply that by 12 breaths per minute, 12 breaths per minute, and that's it. Because it's just asking you how much air are they taking in in that whole minute. Right, so we got to the step here that it was just for one breath. And now they're asking, well, how much air are they taking in for that whole minute? If they took 12 breaths in the minute, okay? So- And does that equal like, when you multiply that, is that gonna be like milliliters? So like we're measuring yeah. the, like, okay. Yeah, so it'll be 200 times 12, is 2,400 mLs. And then this one would be 4,800 mLs. And this is the minute volume, right? Yes. So yeah, you'll be, yeah, it's mils per minute. Does that make sense to you guys? So if you see something like that's just worded and you're like, okay, I know what tidal volume is, you know, and you just gotta kind of break it down in your head. Like, all right, so they're asking me here what the tidal volume is, but what it is in a minute? Oh wait, there's a respiratory rate. All right, well, I can do this. You know, you just gotta encourage yourself. Like I can do this, just ask me that, so. Um, okay, so let's talk about bag size, right? So bag size is, um, again, another part of your title volume. And so we'll, we'll stick with our 20 kilogram. So we'll change it because that way we have like a new whole thing. So, um, so we'll, we'll make, um, I don't know, 36 kilograms, 36, that's super hard though, 36 kilograms, okay? And so we know that bag size equals tidal volume times six. Now, I will disclose some textbooks are have different things written in them um, based on when they are published. Okay. So like I think Mosby's says like title volume or yeah, bag size is title volumes times three. Don't go off of that. Um, and one of the old McKernan's books, I think, I think that's the eighth edition, I think. It's either the eighth or the ninth. It says title volume times five. I have literally checked with multiple VTSs in anesthesia and they go with title volume times six. And like every other anesthesia book I've read plus the new McKernan's goes with title volume times six. So I have no earthly idea why those two books say something completely different. So, but those are the two books that I've found that say something random. So 
just FYI, if you are doing some light reading on the weekends and you come across that and you're like, wait, Beth said this, maybe she's crazy. I am crazy, I'm just not that crazy. Um, so what we can do is that there's two different ways, right? So we talked about the one way that a lot of people do in practice, which is totally fine. But if you guys want to stick with your title volume formula so that you don't get confused, that's totally fine too. So what we'll do is we'll do our 36 kilograms and we have our 10 mils, 10 mils and our 20 mils. Okay, so our 10 mils is 30, 360 mls, right? And then our second one here is 720 mls, okay? And so that is just the tidal volume, okay? So now we're gonna do the multiply by six. So now we're multiplying by six. So we're gonna do 360 times six and we get 2160 mls. And the, our one on the bottom is 4,320 mLs, okay? So remembering that bag sizes come in liters, we are gonna have to change this over to liters, all right? So um, our first answer, remember to you that this one is not gonna be two liter, a two liter bag, because that's gonna actually be too small. Right? And why is that going to be too small? The patient's huge. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, as we grab them, you know, you kind of identify roughly, you know, okay, this might be more for like a 30, 40 pound dog. So to me, that's like, this dog's huge. So two is not sufficient. Right visually <laughs> yeah yeah visually especially if you are used to seeing that right mm -hmm. but why can't we round down is it something to do with like the pulmonary pressures if the bag is too small no no this isn't easy don't get too crazy here <laughs> like it's, because we're using already the formula the what's acceptable the, yeah okay the 10 and the 20 well look at our answer 2160 right if we round down our patient is not getting the appropriate amount right mm -hmm. because they need technically a 2.16 liter bag we don't make that, by the way. But if we round down to a two liter bag, that's not an appropriate size bag, right? So we need to then say, okay, well, our next size up then is gonna be a 2.5 liter bag, right? I mm -hmm. probably would agree with you that like, I wouldn't pick a 2.5 liter bag either, depending on our patient of what it is, but probably wouldn't be my first pick. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't pick a two liter bag either, right? So, so very good. Um, Three, five liter bag. I'm sorry. Um, if you're going in between a 2.5 liter bag and a 4.5 liter bag, why don't you go just right in the middle with a 3.5 liter bag? Oh, maybe. This is where your guys' educated decisions come into play, right? So this is why I say it's really important to do both, both um, 
of your numbers here so that you guys can make that educated decision because as you know, every single animal that could be a 36 kilogram dog, I'm assuming dog, right? Um, is gonna look different, right? You could have a 36 kilogram dog that is a basset hound. You could have one that's a lab. You could have one that's a pit bull. You could have one that's a beagle. So it really depends on like how, what, where you want to, what you want to choose. So is it wrong for you guys to pick a three and a half liter bag versus someone who picked a four liter bag? Probably not, you know, as long as it's somewhere within that range, right? As, as long as you could justify your answer to you. I mean, maybe this dog's like ideal weight is really 60 pounds. And that's why someone picked a three liter bag. Um, so again, that's why I would say like do both rather than there are people, like I said, that do that 60 mils per keg and that's what they go with. Yeah, that's how I learned it was the 60 yeah. mils per keg because that's the only way I've learned it. Yeah. But say that this is on the VTNE and 2.5 and 4.5 are both one of the answer choices. Which one would you go with? They won't be. Okay. Yeah, they won't do that to you. All right. Um, they will probably have you do both calculations, right? And then they'll give you answers like 1.5, 3.0, 5.0, and 0 0.5. And then you gotta pick the best answer, right? So what would you pick? I would probably go with the 3.0. Yeah, the 3.0, right? Cause it's somewhere within your range. And they're just checking to see if you can do the math, right? They just wanna make sure, even though you may not agree completely with, uh, I probably wouldn't have gone with the 3.0, but they wanna make sure that you understand the concept of tidal volume times six to be able to do the math and apply it, right? That you didn't just pick a five liter bag because maybe someone would just pick a five liter bag because we've seen that in practice too. They look at it, a 36 kilogram dog. Oh, it's a big dog. Let's just pick a five liter bag. No, Beth, when they do the 60 mil per K, cause I've seen that and that's yeah. like one of the formulas. Um, when I like just did it just now, I was getting like the same low ball answer. So yeah. it's a 2160. Yeah. Like, is that, like, I don't need to do like a bottom and a top, like we were for tidal volume, you know, but like, I don't know. I feel like that equation is now incomplete since we did all these other steps. So it is great for this one, right? So now just multiply mm -hmm. it by two. There. Okay. There we go. So like in practice, as long as you can do both of those. So even tell your, your team like, Hey, you know, this is great but title volume is actually two answers. So as we know, we get this one here and this is a, just a double, right? We're doubling it. Yeah. So all we have to do is, hey, do 60 times our kegs. And then after we get this answer, multiply it by two. And that way we have both answers. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Now. So for me, I, I don't ever care like how people get there especially since we're going to do it one way, like to know the knowledge to get there for the bt and &E and for school and stuff, as long as you guys understand the concepts to begin with. But like once we're in practice, we have to be able to apply those concepts in a quick manner too. And so if that's the way that it works for you guys and to be able to teach other people to be able to do it, because this is going to take people a long time every single time. So that's totally fine. Yeah. 
I just don't want people to just think that that's the only way is the 60 mils per kg because you are missing a lot, you know, to be able to pick the best for that patient. So definitely do that. And then to let them know, like, there's not one answer there. You know, I don't, I don't want people to be like, oh, because you know how people can get, well, you picked a three and a half liter and I would have picked a four. Well, you know, like that's okay. It's their patient to monitor. And if, as long as they're doing fine, that's totally fine. You have a four liter nearby. If the patient needs it, then they can always switch it out. It's not the end of the world, you know? Um, I mean, we all got to support each other, you know, and how we do it. Um, all right. So any questions on bag size? Great. All right. So let's talk about my friend, Mac. I love Mac. Come back, Mac. Okay. So as we start, sorry, I have a kid in. Um, so what does Mac stand for? Is it main avular concentration? Ooh, very close, very close. The M is the one part we got. Oh, minimum. M is for minimum. Me. Minimum, 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 good. Minimum, oh my God, can't spell minimum. Great. Minimum alveolar concentration. But sorry, the cat. I need to get this cat off of me. Hold on. Okay, perfect. All right, so. Our minimum alveolar concentration. So, what does that mean? Like the minimum amount of gases we're using to accomplish anesthesia. Okay, very good. So, the minimum amount it takes for, for gas to um, concentrate the alveoli in our patients for them to actually go under anesthesia, right? In a nutshell. So when they come up with these um, dosage, so the MAC is actually the dose that they come up with for like our isoflurane and our sevoflurane and anything else, halothane, all of that. So if you look at the package insert you for isoflurane, sevoflurane, whatever you have in your practice, you will see a number in there for your MAC, okay? And that number um, is essentially the um, potency of the drug, okay? So just like if we had serenia, right? Um, the potency is your concentration, right? So serenia is 10 mg per mil. Okay. If we looked at it as a, you know, if it, it were a, an anesthetic drug, that would be its MAC. If we had a comparison, it's not an anesthetic drug, but if it were, that would be its MAC, right? If we, if it was an inhalant, but it's not, um, maybe that's someday they'll do that. Right. I don't know. <laughs> um, so anyway, 
how they figure that out though, right, is that it takes, how it takes is 50% of the animals um, for them to not actually feel any type of pain under anesthesia, okay? So they are like anesthetized with that drug and they don't feel any type of, um, not just pain, but any type of reaction or whatnot um, while they're under anesthesia, okay? No, no sensation um, during a pro anesthetic process is where they come up with this MAC number, all right? So in that sense, they come up with that. So isofluorines MAC is different for cats and dogs. Um, so for dogs, it is um so let's see iso is for dogs roughly 1.3 ish um and then in cats it's about 1.6 Let me make sure that I have this. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, and then in SIBO, dogs are 2.3. And cats are roughly 2.6 on the low end, okay? Um, it can actually go up from there. Um, if we talk about, does anyone ever, has anyone ever heard of desflorine? I have, but we never used it. Okay. Yeah. It's really expensive and it's very similar to um, SIBO and ISO. So they used it in human medicine. Um, dogs, the MAC is roughly on low end, 7.2. And cats is um, on low end, 9.8. Okay. Now, let me look up halothane. Quick, I know how the thing is pretty. I have a question, real quick. Yeah. Um, why is it so much higher in cats than it is in dogs? Cats need a lot. <laughs> Knock <laughs> them out. Um, I am not quite sure. Um, probably because cats are very sensitive. Um, that you know have like a lot of. They, they are truly just very, have a lot more nerve endings and are a little bit more sensitive to things. So that would be my, my biggest guess. Um, so they probably need a little bit more medication. Um, but yeah, that would probably be my guess, but I am not quite sure. Um, Okay, so halothane is roughly over all. I'm just going to give you this. Okay. Um, just because we don't really use halothane anymore, but I, I want to give you a reference of it. So if we're talking about potency, right? We want to talk about which drug is most potent to put to least potent, all right? So out of these, which one is the most potent?
ISO. Mm. Hello thing. Hello thing. Very oh. good. Sorry, I didn't see that one. Yeah, halothane is the most potent, right? And then after that, it's going to be ISO, SIBO, and then dysfluorine, right? Because we are going to need less drug with halothane to accomplish what we need to accomplish, which is anesthesia, right? To anesthetize our patient, okay? However, what's the safest drug that we have to make changes for anesthetic level, stuff like that. SIBO. Right? Or do you mean well, not gas? <laughs> well, out of these four choices. Yeah, we say SIBO too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because you guys have SIBO, right? But out of the, these four choices. The de the death fluorine. Yeah. yeah, it does fluorine, right? Was, After that is SIBO because you guys know SIBO. But why do you guys say SIBO? Because you know SIBO. But why do you say SIBO? It's like easier on them, like how they're metabolized. Like we have a lot of compromised patients. Um, so that's why we use it. <laughs> okay, okay. And that makes sense, right? But if we're talking about minimum alveolar concentration, right, and we're talking about to make changes of their anesthetic level, which one is going to be the safest for potency wise? I guess that's what my question. Like halothane's out. That one is definitely not the safest just because it's really potent. So it's hard to make changes with that because you're either out or you're awake, right? Like there's there's not a lot you can do, right? Would it be the desofluorine then? Because good. of the, the more ranges you have to play with the dosing. Good, good. So yeah. I left this one here because you have never seen this, right? But you guys mm. have seen these two to know the differences, right? So ISO, we go from zero to 5%, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. SIBO, we go from what? Zero to what percent? Goes up to 8%. So we have more room to play with on our vaporizer than five levels, right? Than five different increments. I think sure we can do some half, half percentages on ISO or quarters and stuff, but there's really not that much room, right? Not as much as SIVO. So on dust flooring, we're gonna have some even, even more of a spread than, than SIVO or ISO or even halothane, halothane would be like very small, right? Can you imagine what halothane, I mean, I'm not old enough to even know what halothane <laughs> was. So no, that came out in the fifties. So. Um, so what we do with the Mac, right? To figure out Mac. So um, let me know if you guys actually deal with Mac. So if you work with any anesthesiologists or anything like that, they're actually going to talk to you on a level of MAC a lot of times rather than, oh, maintain them at 2%. They're going to actually talk to you on, hey, let's maintain them at one times MAC or one point, you know, MAC times 1.2 or 1.2 times MAC or whatever, 1.5 times MAC. So that way you're going to have to know what the MAC is of, of the, um, of the anesthetic you're using, number one. Number two, you're gonna have to know how to like do multiply those to figure out your vaporizer setting. So when we talk about these MAC formulas, you are gonna have um, like your light anesthesia roughly. And these are not like figuring out, like figuring in any of your other um, drugs that you're, you're utilizing, 
right? So say you are giving a lot of pre-medications um, or you're also giving like a lot of induction medications too. This is why you can then sometimes maintain them on the more light anesthesia um, settings for your, for, you know, some of your inhalants. So I know Steph was saying like, oh, we sometimes use SIBO for some of our um, compromised patients or whatever. Well, even so on some of your compromised patients, you may even not even have to have a lot of SIBO on them. You know, you could maintain them on a lot of like um, total, you know, IV anesthesia, um, which we call TIVAs, right? We could um, give them some really good um, induction medication a lot of times. So, um, and just kind of maintain them on that and just very small amounts of inhalants throughout that time. So our light anesthesia would be MAC times 1.0. And that gives you your vaporizer setting percent, okay? Now, our surgical surgery, oh, I got can't spell it. Surgery anesthesia. Anesthesia. So that's stage, stage three, plane two anesthesia, right? Is going to be our MAC times 1.5 gives you that percentage, okay? And again, you can do anything in between. So if you're like, mm, we gave some really good induction medication, so maybe I could do 1.2, right? So if you have these already calculated, right? Then you can kind of play with those numbers too with what you know. And then heavy anesthesia. So say you're doing an orthopedic surgery, right? And there's gonna be points in that surgery that are gonna be a little bit more painful than others. So you might have to turn that patient up a little bit, right? So we're gonna have MAC times 2.0. Now again, there's other things that we might be able to give that patient, right? So we can also consider, hey, do we really need to turn our patient up on, you know, um, gas? Or if it's a painful process, to, are we able to give pain medication? Are we able to give some like ketamine? Are we able to give, you know, some dexmedetomidine, you know, as well within our protocol, something to that nature that's going to actually be helpful um, where we don't have to like push our patient onto our gas anesthetic because there are some pretty big downfalls to gas anesthetic as well, especially when we like increase it quite a bit, right? So if we look at our isofluorine, right? And for dogs, what is our, we take 1.3 and we multiply that by one, okay? And so our MAC for light anesthesia is what? One what did it be? 1.3? Good, 1.3, right? So 1.3%. So that would be for your light anesthesia. So you would use this for like when you're probably prepping your patient, you know, getting them ready for surgery because they don't have to be at surgical plane for that, right? Now for a surgical level of anesthesia, you would take that 1.3 and multiply that by 1.5. And we're at about 1.95, so we can say that's about 2%. So how many of you guys maintain your patient about 2% for isofluorine? If they're like not on some other like other medications, you know, if you have them on like a good protocol, you may have them somewhere in between that 1.3 and 2. Yeah, I was going to say we're normally at like 1.5-ish. Good, good. Yeah. So you are right in between that range. That's awesome, right? So um, now heavy anesthesia, right? So we're going to do that 1.3 times 2 is 2.6. 
Okay. So we are definitely, so we want to keep our patient somewhere within these ranges, right? If we are going anywhere above these ranges, then we are technically overdosing our patient on our, and on our um, inhaling, okay? Now, this doesn't mean like when you are actually um, inducing them and putting them at like that 5% or 3% or whatever, or, you know, maybe sometimes that they just need like a few minutes to be at like three or four or whatever, and then you turn them back down. But this means like when you actually put them at like 3% for a long extended period of time, or maybe 4% for a long extended period of time, like that's not good, right? So we need to actually evaluate like why we are turning them up for that long period of time because we do have some bad things that happen when we do keep them at that level for that long period of time, right? So maybe we need to check our drug protocols, right? We need to talk to our doctors of like, hey, you know, I'm noticing them having to keep my patient on um, our gas anesthetic like pretty high for a long period of time. And I was wondering if we can maybe look at like our drug protocols and see if, you know, maybe we can discuss like something that we might be able to change or, or whatever. Now, what are some side effects, right, that happen if we keep our patient on gas anesthesia? for a longer period of time or higher level of an anesthetic for a longer period of time um, that we might not want. We'll see like respiratory depression happen. Okay. Harder time waking up uh, or after anesthesia. Good, yeah. Yeah, they have to metabolize low. that stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. We'll see like um like low like um CO2, like there'll be like hypocapnia good. in there. Very good. So yeah, that respiratory depression for sure. Temperature sometimes drops. Yeah, most definitely. Why does the temperature drop? Lack of perfusion. Ooh, good. Lack of perfusion, right? The blood pressure tanks. We see that in cardio sometimes. Yes. That's like a huge key one, right? Is mm -hmm. blood pressure drops like horribly. And then we're all wondering, oh, why is the blood pressure always dropping? And then you're bolusing fluids and blah, blah, blah. And then in specialty, you're like, oh, we need to start the butamine and your dopamine and it's like oh if you just really understood how to maintain your patient under anesthesia we wouldn't have these issues right like it wouldn't be that big of a deal so it's just everybody wants to just give more drugs all the time right <laughs> sometimes <laughs> so, yeah i just not say yeah we're gonna have difficult patients sometimes so i understood but you know, we have a lot of other medications too in our tool belt that we'll be able to use and help with um, that, that we can utilize that we don't have to always crank up our gas anesthesia because we feel like we're stuck and we just have to keep that patient still for that doctor, right? Um, but there might be some other options. And so what other options do we have? I know for some of the things we do now, granted, we're not doing like your general like spays and neuters or like mass removals, but like, because some of our patients can't be on gas, like for instance, like when we do like a pacemaker procedure, yeah. um, in the initial, like they can't be on gas, like we're already dealing with such low heart rate. So we titrate a lot with ketamine. Yep. Um, uh, because we put them down with like ketamine, um, ketamine and medaz, 
and will titrate and um and not always in like those procedures too and others like will notice like hey we've had this pet like we have sometimes younger pets um come in for like pda procedures and so like we're like okay we've been playing with the gas too much um so sometimes they'll have us like either again titrate with like a little bit more probe or we'll do like a half dose of medaz just enough to like get us through because our seat procedure is like two to three hours yeah and so we rather kind of like bump with that than just like cranking them on like the the SIBO yeah no definitely yeah and I think that's really helpful too and I've seen that a lot more is that whether or not you add in sure you adding in propofol um or some adazlam and also a lot more people are adding in a little bit of ketamine, which is very nice. Uh, knowing that ketamine too can be used for so many different reasons. And I think that they are finding out more and more of the benefits of ketamine is great. Um, know that as well, ketamine is used as a way that we can help just kind of we look at some of the negatives of like, oh, they can cause some rigidity and stuff too, but you can kind of counteract that with the midazolam, but it does make them kind of sit, or not sit still, but be a little bit more still. Um, so that is really helpful. Um, obviously making sure pain management is appropriate too. And I am a huge fan of local blocks. So regardless of what you're doing and stuff like that, we can definitely be way better with our local blocks of wherever, whatever you are doing. So um, utilizing those is super, super important. Um, we're we're going to always have inhalants, right? But there are ways that we can at least stay within our ranges that, that we need, right? So let's look really quick. So I'm sure most of you guys are using ISO in some degree. That's why I'm kind of playing with ISO. But if we look at cats really quick, just so you know, so 1.6 is for our um, light anesthesia, okay? Um, and then for our surgical level, so 1.5 again times 1.6 is 2.4. Okay, so a little bit different than um, for our dog. So it's a little bit higher, right? And again, if you are able to maintain them at a lower surgical level, this is made up because they're, they did this at like that they were very, very basic um, drug protocol, right? So there are such better drug protocols now that we have incorporated like multimodal approaches where we can be somewhere, you know, within a different range. So that's why if you have an anesthesiologist that's saying, hey, we're going to do MAC times 1.2 or one times or 1.3. That way you can stay within that range and it'll be nice. Okay. Um, heavy sedation is 1.6 times 2. So we get 3.2. Okay, so we should be somewhere within these ranges when we have a cat under anesthesia. And I was worried a little bit about cats um, just because there's not a lot to them. They don't have a lot of body fat. Um, they're really small. They can lose heat very easily. Their blood pressure is already hard to um, measure under anesthesia appropriately unless, you know, I feel like at least utilizing a Doppler can be nice too sometimes to get some trends because our, like whether it's a Surgy Vet or a Cardell can be a little bit off because they are so small. So, but looking for trends to make sure that our blood pressure is staying relatively good for them. So I'm um, just kind of keep that in mind. So does that make sense, at least at the Mac? Yeah, that definitely makes a lot more sense now uh, where that kind of comes from. Good. So if they say to you, they give you a bunch of numbers and they're like 0 0.9, 1.6, 8.4, 0 0.7. 
And they're like, okay, out of these, which one is the most potent drug? So it'd be the point seven. Good. Yeah. And so from those, that's um, like, would they give you, I know I might be thinking too intensive of a question, but if they were to ask something like this, would they give you, I'd assume they give you like the drug range, like they would pick one and be like, okay, here's your C, your ISO ranges. Would they ask you like to come up with that percentage for when we do like the um, vaporizer? Like they might. my questions I've seen. Okay, because yeah, a lot of questions mind. I've seen is like, okay, Mac, they just were asking like kind of yeah, concentration stuff, but yeah. would, they would, they should give us like just one or do you think right. they could potentially give you a chart and then you would have to like, if they wanted you to go up the, find that percent, you'd have to know this, right? Like they're not going to give you both. Right. I mean, these. I would know this. Like okay. this is a very common thing to see, like you'll see this in you know, textbook thing, whatever. So yeah, if they gave you, if they gave you something to, to that nature of like, hey, figure out your percentage or whatever, go for it. But I mean, personally, like, is that something that, you know, I would probably test you on, on a vt &E? Probably not. Like, I would probably be like, which one of these are more potent? And I've seen that or like put yeah. into put into order of potency, like which is the most potent to least potent. I've seen that. Um, so yeah, but you never know what they're going to ask, you know? So I know. that's why I like to go through all of it. So you guys do know everything. The comprehension of it all. Yeah. And, and this, I always have to like look up to make sure I know, I usually know roughly what these ranges are for these guys I have I guess always with halothane because I know that it's always so low but I did look it up um and dysphorine I've never used I've only ever because I have a friend that's a doctor so I know that they use dysphorine but I know it's pretty high so um so yeah like these are just good to know for like in practice what those ranges are when you're working so but you don't have to memorize that necessarily for the vt &E. So, So um, I would say like, if they do talk about it, they'll get, they'll give you or provide you this for the vt &E. So, okay. um, but I would say, make sure you know these guys, like MAC times 1.0 is your light anesthesia, the so surgical levels 1.5 um, and your heavy is 2.0. Which kind of makes sense, like if you then kind of work your way back to, hey, okay, ISO is usually around this, you know, that kind of thing. So, all right. So, um, how many of you guys have figured out oxygen level, um, oxygen flow rates? Which is another thing that this is like one of my pet peeves. It's usually a, a doctor thing that they do, but it kind of spills over to technicians. How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? <laughs> I have no idea how to figure any of it out. <laughs> okay, <Yes>. okay, <laughs> perfect then. So we have, as you know, on our anesthesia, we have non-rebreathers and rebreathing systems, right? Mm -hmm. So when we look at our oxygen flow meter, we have to set our patient to a flow rate that they're going to get for, um, for essentially their, their breaths and everything. So whether you know, we have to give them oxygen and then that oxygen is going to spill into their vaporizers so that they can actually get um, anesthesia from the vaporizer, right? So we have to know, again, the dosage of oxygen that they're going to get where we shouldn't just be setting every patient to one liter per minute um, or two liters per minute or whatever. So um, there's a, a formula for it. So our rebreathing 
is 20 to 40 mils per keg per minute. And then non rebreathing is pretty simple 200 to 400 mils per keg per minute. So very easy if you just remember that. So the non-rebreathing, you just add an extra zero to those versus rebreathing. So you have to know who gets what, right? So rebreathing patients are what type of patients? You know, I think it is, isn't it like non rebreathing is under seven kegs or is that rebreathing? Nope, you're right. So under seven kilograms is for non rebreathing. Very good. And then over seven kilograms is rebreathing. Very good. So, and I always say to you, like, oh gosh, they're, you know, 7.1 kilograms. What are you going to do? Like, that's completely a, choice of yours and practice of, you know, what you think you would, the patient's going to benefit more from, right? Technically in every situation, like we could have a 90 pound dog on a non-rebreathing system if you really wanted to. The issue with that is, is that if we had a patient on a non-rebreathing system that was really huge, we're going to waste so much gas for that patient that's not needed, right? So the reason why we have non-rebreathing system is for these little patients, we can change their um, gas at, at any point. Every single breath is a new gas, right? So they're so small that we, we don't want them to rebreathe old gases because it would take a long time to change their anesthetic depth where those bigger patients we can change the anesthetic depth pretty quickly because they take large breaths out of that reservoir bag um, and those gases then flow out pretty quickly versus if we did that to a small patient, it's going to take them much longer to get rid of those, those gases the same way. So that's the big reason why the bigger ones don't have the non-rebreathing, right? But you could if you really wanted to. You're you just spend a lot of money on oxygen and um, anesthesia. So, um, so anyway, so what we're gonna do here is we are going to pick, oh, I don't know, let's do 26 kilogram dog, okay? And so a 26 kilogram dog is gonna be a what? Rebreathing. Rebreathing, right? So we're going to say, okay, 26 kilograms, right? And we are going to do 20 mils and then also 40 mils. So again, we have two answers for this, okay? And I'm going to tell you why I like the two answers in here because um, I utilize both of them. So um, we are going to do 26 times 20. And we get 520 mLs, okay? And then our next answer, so 26 times 40 is 1,040 mLs. And again, we need to put this in liters because it's liters per minute, right? We can't forget our minutes. So we're going to divide that by 1,000 mLs, divide that by 1,000 mls and we are going to get roughly 0 0.52 liters per minute and we are going to get 1.04 liters per minute okay so in this case we can run our patient on 0 0.5 two liters per minute, or, you know, you can do 0.6 liters per minute if you want, just to make sure. Um, or you can also run your patient at about one liter per minute as well. So what I typically do is 
we know that in the beginning of when we are um, having our patient under anesthesia, you know, the first maybe five, 10 minutes, we want to run our patient at a little bit higher um, oxygen to like really oxygenate their brain. So we may run our patient at this higher rate. As long as they're doing well, we can actually back off that oxygen and have them on a little bit lower oxygen rate. So that's why I like having both of these. Um, so then I can back it off to maybe like 0 0.6 liters per minute. And as long as they're oxygenating okay, because we have our pulse acts, as long as they're breathing okay, you know, that type of thing, then we can back them off to 0 0.6 liters per minute, right? So how many of you guys actually have a 26 kilogram dog, right? And you maintain that patient at 0.6 liters per minute. So no, I was gonna say it's probably like one. Not really, yeah. Yeah. So what is the downside of having animals at higher oxygen rates um, throughout anesthetic procedures? They get cold? Yeah, oxygen is super cold, right? Super, super cold. So again, as long as they're doing well and whatever, we can we can kind of back down our oxygen at least a little bit, right? We don't have to give them that much. Um, they're still going to be able to get the same amount of anesthesia that you need to give them. And we're also wasting oxygen. We're wasting gases, you know? Uh, you're wasting oxygen. You're wasting your anesthetic. Um, by keeping them at that higher rate. So if we back it down um, to a little bit more appropriate level, then, and your patient's doing fine, um, we're actually preserving their heat um, and uh, another way to preserve the heat and they'll do fine. So that is how I've always maintained them is knowing both of these and then, yeah, starting here and then maintaining here. Where some people will like, pre-oxygenate or like, you know, in the beginning, oxygenate at like three liters per minute. That's just insane. That's insane. That's a lot of oxygen. Um, they actually do a completely fine with being at that one liter. Per minute. Um, so let's do another one. Let's do, we have a patient who is 4.3 kilograms. Actually, I lie. Let's do another one that is, that will be too easy. Um, 6.4 kilograms. So if it's 6.4 kilograms, what are we going to do? Rebreathing or non rebreathing? Non rebreathing. Non rebreathing. Very good. So we are going to do our 200 mLs and then our 400 mLs, right? Very good. And so we have 6.4 times 200. We get 1,280 mLs. And then our second one is 2,500 mLs. And then we're going to divide each by 1,000 mLs. All right. So we'll end up being at about 1.3 liters per minute on this guy. And this one will be somewhere about, we'll say, 2.6 liters per minute. Okay, just to like arrange it. So as you can see here, right, we have 
our first answer was 1.0 liters per minute, just so you can see the ranges. Here are our ranges here. So our 26 kilogram animal compared to our 6.4 kilogram animal. Why does our 6.4 kilogram animal have higher oxygen flow rate than our 26 kilogram animal? Because it's on a non rebreather and you need higher O2. Why? Because you're losing so much um, oxygen. Why are you losing it? Because of the type of system, the non rebreathing system. Okay. It's not a uh, filtering. It's not coming back to them. How is it not coming back to them? Because they can't uh, breathe it out like the larger animals. Mm. But they're not taking big enough breaths. No, not necessarily. It's because like you, you they gotta remove the carbon dioxide more. Like that's why they need that O2 rates. So say we have our reservoir bag right here compared to our reservoir bag here, okay? If we fill up our bag each breath, right? Maybe our dog takes in part, part of that air, right? And then it comes back and some of it comes back, right? But brand new air comes in, fills it up more, but they take more in here. Okay, there's still some in here. Takes it up more, still more, okay? Here, we fill it all up, they take a breath and it goes away. There's no recycle. Right? There's no recycle system. They get a brand new breath every single time. In this case, they only need a little bit at a time because we're recycling some of that breath that they had already taken because they might not have taken all of that breath. Does that make sense? So if you're using a non-rebreather non because they are taking um, a full clean breath every time you have to use more right so more a not yeah a non rebreather is that we are are giving them one breath right and then whether they take it or not it gets tossed out of the system but for a rebreather we give them that air and if they don't take that air, we save it for the next breath. So we like keep saving and saving and saving in case they need it. And it's a recycle system. So that's why sometimes if you guys turn up your oxygen, Right, if it's too high, 
your bag is going to get way filled here. It's going to get overfilled because your reservoir, right? That's why it's called a reservoir. It's saving it. Is It's overfilled with the save, right? So you got to get rid of it because you, you have saved too much. It's like chipmunk cheese. You've saved it too much. But with here on the non-rebreathing, we aren't saving anything. We are big wasters. We waste everything after each breath. Does that make sense? More sense, at least? So we actually need a higher dose of oxygen and stuff in the non-rebreathing because we need to be able to push all of that out to our patient because there has been no like reservoir to give them the next breath. We're like catching up to those breaths where, you know, it, they're, they're like living paycheck to paycheck essentially, where in the rebreathing, it's like, well, they've saved, so they don't need to live paycheck to paycheck, right? They, they can actually take the next breath, you know, if, if they needed to, because you know, they, they can they can take a little at a time kind of thing, okay? Um, so when we have all patients on the same amount of oxygen, right? If they're all at 1.5 liters per minute or all at two liters per minute, that's when you start seeing like weird things where, like I said, you have your reservoir bag for your big patients that are getting really big. Um, well, we shouldn't. You know, we, we start seeing that like our manometer um, is kind of creeping up by having a pressure on, um, you know, just by uh, expiratory. Yeah, expiratory or inspiratory, right? Um, it's, it's a back flow um, pressure, right? We shouldn't have that. So you have to then, you know, decrease that pressure and it shouldn't be building right? So we have to turn our oxygen down. So that's why we need to have these calculations done. So we know how much oxygen we should be giving our patient. Okay. We should know how much oxygen we're giving our smaller patients because we need to know how much oxygen we should be feeding to our patient so that they can actually be oxygenated appropriately and getting to them in that amount of time, because maybe they're waking up during a procedure because you're actually not getting that anesthetic agent to them for each breath, right? Maybe you're only giving 0.5 liters per minute because that's what you thought you were supposed to give. Well, that's not enough to get all of that to that patient. Or maybe you're only doing one liter per minute. Well, that's not enough for this patient. You need to get it faster to them. Okay. So Beth, if we're using the rebreathing on a a uh, uh, less than k seven k patient. We yep. still use the the twenty and forty mLs. I'm sorry. So if you're using uh, the rebreathing on the uh, on the smaller patients, okay. Do we still use to get this bag size? Do we still yeah. get use the twenty and forty? Okay. No. So if you were to use the rebreathing on a small patient, you said. Uh huh. Yes. So if you did for oxygen flow rate, if you say did like for the 6.4 pig, yeah. So you would do 20 mils and 40 mils okay. for that. So yeah, yeah. Okay. it would. So here is where it gets weird, right? So yeah. you would end up doing 6.4 6 times 20, right? That's 128 mls. And then times that is 256 mLs, right? Um, and then we divide that by 1,000 mLs. So for these guys, right, it ends up being, you know, 0 0.128 liters and 0 0.256 liters. However, in order to get our vaporizer to work appropriately and get enough oxygen to our patient, um, we can't go less than 0.5 liters per minute for any patient, 
okay? No matter what system you're using, whether it's a rebreather or non-rebreather. So in this case, you would have to run it at 0.5 liters per minute. So even though I wouldn't recommend for this patient to be on a rebreathing system because they're so small, this is how you would do the calculation, right? Because it's on a rebreathing system. But that's a great question of how do you do that math? Because we are at a low range here. You would end up just rounding up to 0.5 liters per minute. Okay. So okay. then because yeah, the bags are, so we would have to use a one. So this isn't for bag size. Remember, this is I'm for sorry. your, your oxygen flow rate. Oh yeah, God. I know a lot of people get confused on that because we're doing so much math. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That's a good question. So this is for your manometer of like how you turn it up on your manometer uh, for the the oxygen flow rate. Oxygen, okay. Yeah, so your little bobbin or ball that you guys have before mm -hmm. you turn it. Now, okay. again, for your bag size, right? This is where your bag size is that tidal volume times six, right? So you can do the, you know, some of you guys like the 60 times kilograms. And then after that, you could do times two. Right. Or you could do, oh my gosh, I'm throwing you guys for a loop. You could do 60 times kilograms and then 120 times kilograms, right? Because it's the same thing. It's just multiplying by two. Oh my gosh, look at that. Um, so either way, right? Or you're just doing you're just doing tidal volume times the six. So it's right, it's that 10 to 20 mils times. 10 to 20 mils times kilograms, right? And then we're multiplying that times that six. So we have that 6.4 kilograms times 10 mils times 20 mils, okay? So we have 64 and then we have 128 mils. Should stop doing math in my head. I haven't had all my coffee yet. Um, so 64 times six is 384 mils. Ran out of room. And then 128 times six is. Oh, look at this, 768. This is a good one. So this is like an awkward one, right? So then you divide these by a thousand so that you can get a bag size. So what bag size do you choose for this one? But this is, these are awkward, right? Very. <laughs> but this one's actually really easy because what's the only bag size that makes sense? you guys the three well oh. um not three because remember we have sorry i ran out of room so here 384 mls divided by 1000 oh. right is 0 0.384 ah All right okay. technical difficulties here <laughs> um 384 liters, right? And then 768 mLs divided that by 1,000 equals 0 0.768 liters. So we have to think of the bag sizes we have within this range. So would a liter bag fit in that range? Uh, no. Good. No, it's too big, no. right? It's, yeah, 0. 0.5. Yeah, 0. 0.5 liter, right? Yeah. 0. 0.5 liter is our only option. Mm. 
Yeah, because I was okay. I need to remember to do the the bye bye a thousand because it throws me off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and then looking at those numbers, my head is going to one liter. Like if I, you yeah. know, like if I'm not really thinking about it, I'm like, oh no, a liter. Yeah. It's, right. Because you're like, oh, I can just round up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you got to look at the range here and go, wait, I got to look at this middle option here because that mm -hmm. leader, sure, we can totally give that animal a leader, right? But mm -hmm. that's not the only option. That might not be the best option because mm -hmm. that leader is technically too big, okay? That's true, yeah, because the, the most we could give if we're doing it according to numbers is the 0. 0.7, right? That's yeah. the most. Yeah. So, okay. So <laughs> let's try first the half liter. And we can have that leader bag just nearby. And if we need to switch over, we need to switch over. But technically, the best option for this pet is a half liter. It's It fits within the range. So if you have someone who wants to be sassy with you, who doesn't know how to do the math, and they just look at the pet and say, well, that's not six. 0.4 kilogram animal or, you know, 13 or whatever pound animal, you should do a leader bag. And you're like, well, I did the math and this is the best option. So I'm going to do that and I'm going to have the leader bag near me. So thank you for your input. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, but it makes sense because yeah, everybody probably would I mean, I would have brought, oh, yeah, let's go to the one liter bag. But yep. if you really want to do the math and do it properly, then you'll know. <laughs> yep. Um, and for those who already do, that's 60 mils times kigs. They get the 384. So they're already probably doing about a half liter anyway. So that makes sense. And then they could just multiply by two. They're getting seven, six or sorry, 768. So now we're starting to get, again, our ranges and then they can make that educated guess. But again, you're not going to be picking, typically your first guess is not going to pick that leader bag. So, all righty. Any questions? Look at all that math today. Ah, crazy. You guys did a lot. You got all the ventilator stuff and all of that. Too much. So. Great. All righty. So this week we're going to talk about some surgery stuff. Um, so go ahead and jump to that as well. Um, let me know if you have any questions or anything like that. You guys are doing a great job on our VTNE prep site with questions and everything, giving answers and all of that. But let me know if you have any additional questions. Have a great week. And you'll be uh, oh. posting this video. Sorry. You'll be posting it uh, today. I was going to rewatch it to write down the information that we discussed. Okay, oh. sorry. sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask you if you were going to post um, this video on, on YouTube, just because I wanted to write down all the, like, make flashcards about what yes. we spoke about. Okay. Yes, I'm um, going to upload it. It has to do, like, two uploads. So, yeah, I'm going to upload it today and then get it uploaded for you guys as well. So, it appreciate it today. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. Sorry about that. My dog's crazy. Today. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Of course. <laughs> Thank take you. care. Bye. 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 Bye, guys.